Good afternoon. My name is Nadia Plesner. I'm a visual artist from Denmark. And I'm here to give a very short recap of what happened the last six years of my life. Um, because in order to explain to you what happened with one of my artworks, I need to go back to 2006, where I moved from Denmark to the Netherlands to study art at the Art Academy in Amsterdam. Um, the life that I imagined there, the artworks I would make, the people I would meet, uh, was not exactly how it unfolded. And a series of events that is too long to explain here today um, led me to living in a caravan in the countryside in Holland uh, after a traffic accident, completely uh, broken to pieces, unable to walk with a constant uh, headache, um, no school, uh, not much of a social life, and just confined in this little caravan. It was a very uh, uh, intense period of my life. Uh, I was very depressed, I had a lot of pain. And yet, in that period, uh, something started that got me on the road that I'm on today and made me realize what I wanted to do with my art as soon as I got better. Because while I was in bed in this caravan, I was reading a newspaper, and inside this newspaper, there was a very small update on the situation in Darfur in Sudan, mentioning uh, what was going on, that people were still being killed um, three years into the genocide that started in 2003. And then on the opposite page was a full article about Paris Hilton going to prison. And this was a serious newspaper. And as I watched it and I read it, I realized that my the frustration I had felt before on similar events, uh, the way I felt that some parts of the media gave more and more space to entertainment and gossip and less and less space to important news updates, was something that I wanted to do something about as soon as I got better. So I started brainstorming about how I could make a work that could uh, sort of deal with the disappearing boundaries between the editorial and advertising departments of the media if I could make a drawing that could sort of uh, be a test or sort of experiment in how you could influence the mass media if you use some of the tools that are normally used to get a lot of attention. The result was this, was this drawing. It's called Simple Living, and it was simply an attempt to raise awareness about the situation in Darfur by pimping one of the child victims with some of the items that are used by American celebrities. The big designer bag, a small dog dressed in a pink outfit, and then put it back into this gigantic flow of images and see what happens. I had this image printed on t-shirts that I started selling to raise money for an organization called Divest for the Four. And as I started to sell the first t-shirts and this image started to spread out in the media and people started debating which way we were going with Western media and how it could be influenced, uh, I received a very, very thick envelope from Paris and France. Uh, inside was an 80 page lawsuit from Louis Vuitton's head office <laughs> telling me that they had noticed my campaign, and as much as they appreciated my efforts, they could in no way allow me to use their brand in this way. So they asked me to stop selling the t shirts immediately, take this image off my website, uh, sign a letter that I would stop on that day, and fax it back to them. Uh, since this piece of work was sort of what made me come out of my sick bed, it was what gave me the energy to go to my rehabilitation classes and so on, and it was really the, the one thing that kept me going. I was in no way ready to just give up just like that, and I was very infuriated with this letter and the way that these 80 pages portrayed me as a cold, manipulating bitch hijacking this brand to be famous. I didn't recognize the way I was described, and I felt like I had not been heard at all. Louis Vuitton had taken this case to the court in Paris, and they had an ex parte uh, verdict uh, from the judge, which means that they basically ran the case without me. It's normally a procedure that is used to shut down copy factories in China or things like that, but in this case they used it uh, against an artist, which is very uncommon. Nevertheless, the verdict was that this was illegal and I should pay 15,000 euros per day that I would continue to show this image. Online, or in a gallery, or on a t-shirt, or whatever. So the clock was ticking from the date I received the letter. Of course, this was uh, 
upsetting news and I felt scared. Uh, at the same time, I also felt very infuriated and, uh, and violated on my artistic freedom. And I spoke to my father, who is a journalist, and he said to me, if you don't want to back down, you should get a lawyer and call the press. So that's what I decided to do. I called a Dutch newspaper called the Volkskrant and I explained this case. The next morning they ran a super small piece about it without an image and then it spread out like nothing I've ever seen before. So all of a sudden it was everywhere. The fact that it got media attention uh, helped me a lot because I could feel that Louis Vuitton started to act a little different now that people were watching. They had to be a little bit more careful. Um, meanwhile, I received a ton of letters from other artists around the world <laughs> who also had used uh, the Louis Vuitton pattern in their own works. So this is not completely representative of the people that contacted me, but I got the idea that many artists had indeed been threatened by Louis Vuitton and they all decided to back down. So they wrote to me, they either didn't have the money to fight this or they didn't dare to fight it or whatever reason they had, they didn't fight it. So they said to me, please continue because we are a lot of people that have been harassed this way. Um, I happen to have a friend in New York who saw the opening of the show that included uh, an electrical chair with the Louis Vuitton pattern and the chainsaw and weapons. And my friend contacted this artist and asked him, did you also have problems with Louis Vuitton? And he said, no, actually, they called me and wished me good luck with the selling. <laughs> <laughs> so for some reason, these weapons are not uh, against the, the brand, or I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that, but he didn't have any problems. Um, so meanwhile, this was going on in the media, and Louis Vuitton was pressuring me very hard for a meeting. They said, you have to come to Paris to the Louis Vuitton mansion and meet with us. We need to talk about this and see if we can find some common grounds. I got the help from two lawyers, and we went to Paris, to this mansion. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to take photos, so this is just an image from Mexico. <laughs> but <laughs> we went inside in this uh, gigantic mansion where everything inside has this pattern, from the carpets to the couch, the glasses, the cups, the artworks, the pets, Everything had this pattern, and it occurred to me that it would be difficult to have a real conversation about this art piece <laughs> within this frame that was so clearly on one side. Um, they took me around the mansion, very beautiful. They took me through the rose garden, and then in the end we came to this small workshop where an old French guy was sitting making one bag with his hands. And they said to me, as you can see, we're just a small family business. <laughs> uh, after the tour, we went to sit down in the living room and we had coffee and there were ten waiters giving out little cakes. Uh, and we talked about the case and they, ex they explained to me uh, their concerns about this artwork. They said, we're not responsible for what's happening in the four, so we do not wish to be related to it. And the way you have been acting like a parasite on our brand has been very disturbing to the people that work for us. It has led to broken families. I said, well, I'm very sorry about that, but you have to realize that this artwork is not specifically about Louis Vuitton as a brand, it's about the way the media works, and uh, in the way that the media has responded to this work in this case, clearly I had some sort of a point, because it is now proving itself. Uh, one of the people working for them told me, look, this will be very easy. If you just decide today to stop using this drawing, take everything away from your website, then uh, it would be a very good decision for you because we are very powerful people. So you would like to be friends with us. Just imagine a young artist like yourself, if you have us backing you, there is no limits to what you can do. The only thing you have to do is to sign this paper that you will never do it again, and you have to give a public apology. Then uh, the bad cop attorney took over and he said, but if you don't stop this, then I will tell you what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to crush you completely financially. This bill that is already counting, it's on 200,000 euros already. I have my fees, it's about 50,000 euros. Then he listed a lot of other financial things. He said, and that's just the money thing. If you think it's been stressful up until now with letters and phone calls and this, it will only get worse. 
We will put on as many full-time attorneys as we have to to crush you, and believe me, you don't have a chance. We can also use our power to make sure that, as an artist, you will never ever be able to exhibit at any good gallery or museum in your life. And maybe the press likes you now, but we can change that by feeding them false stories. So this was all very warming to me, um, and I got more and more furious and as we talked, and I asked my attorney, can they really do this? And he said, well, they've been known to do it before. He said, it's a problem because if we go to court, it can take eight to, eight to ten years. And besides that, it will absorb all your energy for those eight to ten years, it's also going to cost you a lot of money. And the lawyer fee is already on 15,000 euros now, and you're a student, so I don't know how you're expecting to pay that, but you can see it will be difficult. He said, it's too bad you didn't make an oil painting. Then you could have done what you wanted. So I went home and I thought about this, and it seemed like the best thing I could do was to sort of regroup my art. I stopped selling the t-shirts, and then I started making a painting. Um, I didn't want to just paint the simple living drawing into a canvas, it seemed like not the way to go. Then I thought, okay, if I'm going to make it into a painting, I'm going to make it into a complete work. And as I started thinking about political paintings, I immediately thought of Picasso's Guernica. So I figured, what if I make a modern version of Guernica called the Fornica, and then I paint the same things that I wanted to put in the simple living drawing. So after one and a half years, I completed the Fornica in the same size as the original painting. It's three and a half meters high and almost eight meters long. And besides the simple living boy as a centerpiece, which I of course wanted to include, I also painted some of the celebrity gossip stories that got a lot of media attention in the same time period as the genocide has been going on in uh, Darfur. And some of the things that I thought should have made headline news. For example, that the Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir, he purchased uh, Russian bomber planes, and then he had them painted white and stenciled with the UN logo before they flew in over villages and bombed them. So you can imagine how the people must have felt when they thought, oh, now the help is finally coming, only to realize that it was bombers. Um, so some of these things I tried to include in the painting, and then it was exhibited in Copenhagen in January 2011. Um, during the course of the show, we had a lot of great debate, people were very open to this, and we, uh, we talked and we discussed, and a lot of things happened during this mo that month. So I returned to Holland, super exhausted and happy, uh, and when I came home, I found a new uh, thick envelope. <laughs> and I recognized it, and I thought, oh, here we go again. So while I had been in Copenhagen doing the show, uh, Louis Vuitton had went to court this time in The Hague, again without me. And again, a judge had ruled that this painting was illegal, and I should again pay, this time 5,000 euros per day, that I would continue to show the painting. It also uh, included a letter from a plaintiff that had been ordered to go to my house and collect any sort of item I must have in my home with any sort of Louis Vuitton-looking pattern on it. T-shirts, posters, sketches, the painting, everything could be taken away. Um, this time, I just thought, okay, enough is enough. This is clearly an artwork. There's no way they can argue that it's fashion or it's anything else. So I wanted to fight it. So again, I contacted the media. Again, they supported me massively. And the first thing we did was to take the painting away from the gallery and into sort of hiding space because they had now the court's order that they could confiscate it. Then a Danish museum called Hart stepped in and they said, okay, this is ridiculous, we want to take this painting, put it in the museum and we will protect it. So that was absolutely amazing for me that they, they stepped up and they, they also acknowledged that it was an artwork um, to go against that Louis Vuitton said that it was a Louis Vuitton product. Um, after I decided to go to court this time and to fight it, of course it was... Um, it was tough and I was scared, but I was very moved by the fact that so many people reached out to me with emails and phone calls and letters. Some sent me postcards. Um, the whole art community sort of stood up with me. And actually it was even more than the first time around because people reacted in a way where they said like, okay, first time it was stupid, but now it's like completely ridiculous. And then suddenly something happened that Artists and cartoonists, they decided to support me in a new way. 
They figured if we all start painting the bag, then she's not alone. It had to come, this one, I think. <laughs> and then, as we were preparing to go to court, a seven-meter-high simple living boy appeared on a building in Maastricht over the night. So, in all these various ways, people were very supportive to me, and they constantly reached out to me and let me know, just move on, you're not alone, which was exactly what I needed at that moment to have the guts to go through with it. Then, uh, in May 2011, Finally, we came to the day where we had to meet in court, and this was then over the three years that it went by from the first drawing. It was my first time to express to a judge why I made this art piece, what it meant to me, why I figured that it should be allowed, etc. And a lot of fellow artists, they went with me to the courthouse, and they had made these badges that they were handing out to people coming to support me. So we wore the badges, and we went inside, and... Uh, Honestly, I was very, very scared to sit there. It felt uh, extremely weird to sit in front in this room uh, with five Louis Vuitton representatives lined up with all their translators and people looking mean to me. And we sat there and then we had insisted that we needed a one-to-one -one print of the painting inside the courtroom as evidence. Um, <laughs> The people working in the court, they told me that it was uh, by far the largest piece of evidence ever committed in any case. <laughs> so we brought it in, we put it up, and then uh, everything that had been going on in my mind and, and, and it, within this, the course of this case, I had 45 minutes with my attorney to express it to the judge. At that day, the final bill, or the bill so far, was at 485,000 euros. So, of course, I was also a little bit worried that I would have to pay that if things went wrong. Um, but we expressed why we thought it was important that I would have the freedom of speech to show this work, that it should not be confiscated, I should be allowed to use it and show it around the world. Then they had 45 minutes to prove to the judge why it shouldn't be allowed, that I was uh, mean and manipulative, uh, they mentioned a paragraph that is something about parasitic behavior, <laughs> eating off the precious flower of the Louis Vuitton brand, etc., etc. Uh, so we explained as good as we could. It went very fast. Um, and then by the end of the day, it was sort of mixed emotions because you don't get the verdict right away. We had to wait four weeks. So within those four weeks, it was... You know, you go through it in your head over and over and over. You think, did I say it the right way? Did the judge understand it? Uh, what will happen if I have to pay this money? And what should I do with my art? And then finally, after a month, I was waiting all day to get the call from the attorney. They said they would know by two o'clock, and it was five minutes to two. And then my phone rang, and the attorney just yelled like, yeah, we won, we won. So the judge had explained in his verdict that, in this case, it was a conflict between two rights, the right to protect your brand and the right to express yourself freely. And in this case, the right to express yourself freely weighed more. So therefore, he quashed the first verdict it, it, entirely, uh, meaning that now I'm free to show both works in any shape or form I wish, wherever I want to do it, which is, of course, amazing, I think. Uh, not just for my work, but also for all the other artists that have been threatened <laughs> not to show their works. Um, while we were in the courtroom, Louis Vuitton constantly kept talking about or trying to prove that it was indeed it was possible to show this, to express what I wanted to show with this uh, work without using the bag. But for me, that's not the point at all. You can express everything you want in any way you want it, but for me, the point is that artists should be allowed to express the way they want to do it, regardless of what authority wants them to do it in a different manner. Um, this has been an important case because now it's used in cases like it uh, to prove 
um, it sort of it fought back and gained a little more territory for the artists uh, instead of for the corporations. And to end this, I just want to say that I feel very honored to be here today with all these very courageous and brave people. And what I have been through was more stress and financial threats, but I really strongly believe in how important it is to stand up against uh, the authorities that try to silence artworks, regardless of who they are. And in the West, where I work, capitalism has really become uh, a strong player, and so it's also very important to keep fighting for our right to express ourselves the way we want to. Uh, and this conference and this way of joining forces and teaming up is, for me, really the way to do it. We need free art, and we need to free pussy right. <laughs> Thank you.